Of course, you know um, the definition of a father, don't you? Yeah? Uh, A father is a man who carries photographs where his money used to be. <clears throat> so, so, friends, you are this morning, there, there's nothing up on the screen. Um, so I encourage you if, you, if you've got your Bible app on your phone, to, to follow, follow that. Or if you've got your Bible with you, always good to sometimes just uh, not look at the screen and enjoy our, you know, the Word of God in front of us. So that's what we're doing today. So we continue the journey with Jeremiah, uh, having started a little bit with him last week. Uh, it's not difficult to sideline God as the Israelites did uh, way back in the days of Jeremiah. It seemed like all was going well. People were trying to live good lives and the good life, but without God. And Jeremiah knew otherwise. He knew that God didn't want to be on the periphery of their lives. He knew God wanted to be central to their whole lives. He knew that each person was made for a living, loving relationship with God. He knew each person was made for a, for a, you know, in his image and for a relationship with God. And Jeremiah also knew that if they continued as they were, as they were there would be consequences, you know, negative ones for their lives. And so he intervened. He knew that society would increasingly become more and more secular uh, if they didn't begin to follow God. And so Jeremiah chapter 3, verse uh, 21, he writes, A cry is heard on the barren heights, the weeping and pleading of the people of Israel, because they have perverted their ways and have forgotten the Lord their God. And he cries to them, Return, faithless people, I will cure your backsliding. And sadly, the reality is that Jeremiah's pleadings were not listened to. The people continued as they were, and God allowed them to be taken into captivity. And the first of the leaders were taken into exile. And then for the 11 following years, from 598 to 587 BC, the people remained in Israel. You know, people, the leaders went off first, and a whole bunch of them, most of them stayed behind, but they were under this, this leadership of Babylon, far away, political leadership, and locally, um, they kind of lived these sort of constrained lives. And so during this time, um, the, 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 the Israelites, without Jeremiah's blessing, they, they try and form this alliance with Egypt. Uh, they, they want to throw off the yoke of the Babylonians, and they try and form this alliance, as, as many times we do. Um, and of course, it, it doesn't go well. There's no money in it for the Egyptians. It becomes a costly exercise. So they kind of leave the Israelites. They abandon them. Um, <clears throat> so when Jeremiah writes about the field in Anatoth that um, was read to us this morning, things are not going well. He's in a kind of a prison. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, he's, he's had enough of these, these sort of, the, the, well, well, the people have had enough of his pessimistic warnings. Uh, so they've put him in this prison. Um, he's been falsely accused of collaborating with the enemy. So, but, you know, who cares anyway? As, you know, Jeremiah's on this little solo mission. He's like one of those guys who's trying to cross the Atlantic on a little solo canoe. You've seen them? All by them little, little selves. And there, there goes Jeremiah again. You know, same old message, same old warning. So they end up you know, putting him in this little prison. Um, he, he's got a bit of freedom. He's still visible. It's not prison prison. He's got some access. Um, but he's restricted. And it's during this time that Jeremiah does something quite crazy, something quite extraordinary, something that seems totally bizarre. The situation looks completely hopeless. He's in this kind of semi-prison. The Babylonians are surrounding the city. They're knocking on the city doors, on the gates. Um, you know, exile is about to happen. His warnings have come to nothing. If this was a tennis final at Roland Garros or Wimbledon, you know, the... the, the the player would be two sets down, five love in the final set. Um, you know, and for Federer, even that would be difficult. And so in these circumstances, why would Jeremiah do something so crazy like buy a field in Anatoth? A a stukje grond. And it's near his hometown, just outside his hometown. It's sort of five kilometers northeast of Jerusalem. A field he would most likely never see. 
or used, a field he would no, most likely never plant a vineyard on, a field that he, he would never raise a crop on. So we might well ask, why buy a field? And dads, fathers, grandfathers, you know what it's like to be pressed into a corner, don't you? When you're between a rock and a hard place. Economic pressure does that to you. A bleak political outlook does that to you. And when fear sort of grips your heart, you're worried about your children and your future. What's going to happen to them? And so why did Jeremiah do it? Why did he do it? Because he believed that God was at work, despite their circumstances. He believed that God was going to turn bad into good. It was a faith investment. It was a faith investment that the God of his people, the God he knew, was going to turn things around in the future. And even though things looked hopeless on the home front, that God alone, and friends, it when, it's when we are at our most hopeless that the God of hope loves to intervene. And look at Jeremiah 32, verse 15. For this is what the Lord God Almighty says. I mean, remember, the enemy is in camp. In fact, the enemy are camped on the very field in Anatoth that Jeremiah is going to buy. The, the, the socio-political pressure is banging on the door. And look what he says. For this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Houses, fields, and vineyards will again be bought in this land. Don't you love that? <laughs> it was a faith investment. And parents and dads in particular today. You know what is so amazing? You know, this whole journey Jeremiah's had with his people where he's been saying, listen, this is going to happen. You know, bad things are coming. I'm warning you. Even though despite all that, and no one has listened to him. Um, he doesn't waste his time saying to the Israelites, I told you this would happen. Nor did he say, if only you'd listened to my warnings, none of this would have happened. He was not an I told you father. He was not an I told you so parent. He was not an if only dad. It was all water under the bridge. All he wanted was that God's purposes would happen for the family of God, for Israel. That's all he wanted. Dads, how are you doing with that, by the way? Are you an if only dad? And so he took out his wallet or his money pouch and he weighed out the 17 shekels of silver. He got the required witnesses. He got the necessary documents signed, sealed, and delivered. Please understand this, friends. No stockbroker, no financial advisor would advise, advise Jeremiah to buy this field near his home in Anatoth. The economic, social, and political climate looked terribly bleak. Does this sound familiar, by the way? It looked terrible. The sensible thing would have been to go offshore with your investments. <laughs> Does it sound familiar at all? You know, why buy a field in Anatoth? Because God had whispered. He, God had whispered. He said, fields will be bought and sold. Houses will be bought and sold. Once again, God will work his purposes for his people. He got out his money, money pouch. And why did he do it? Because amongst all the negative, pessimistic voices, Jeremiah heard the whisper of God. Jeremiah 32 Verse 8 to 9, I knew that this was the word of the Lord. I knew that this was the word of the Lord. So I bought the field at Anatoth from my cousin, Hanamel. So friends, not only was this a faith investment but Jer for Jeremiah, it was also a deliberate act of hope. It was a deliberate act of hope. It was hope beyond reason. And dads and grandfathers, isn't this our calling? Isn't this our calling to have hope beyond reason? Hope beyond reason. Hope in our wives that they will become fully what God intended them to be. Hope in our children that they will become fully what God has planned for their lives. 
Theodore Hesburgh said, the most important thing a father can do for his children is to love their mother. That our children will experience abundant life. That they will come to Christ and live the fullness of what he's got for their life. Could you say amen to that, dads? And, and dads, by the way, you'll know when you're living in hope beyond reason. You'll know it when you're swimming upstream. You'll know it when it's hard and difficult. Because everyone else is swimming, swimming downstream. You'll know it when it's hard and difficult. Hope when everyone else is doubting. As some author said, hope gives wings to the soul. And so Paul, in his letter to the Romans, uh, in chapter 5, and he explains why we all, especially the fathers today, should be able to live as Jeremiah did, with hope beyond reason. You know, making faith investments that don't make sense. Making these Act, these deliberate acts of hope that are beyond reason. A practical faith. A very, very practical faith. A faith not of just being a spectator in the stands. And I think we've got a little bit of hope for, for SA Rugby at the moment, haven't we? And, and you know, uh, you know who, how, how are the, you know, the schoolboys going to going to learn what it is to play courageously and full of passion unless the older guys do it. Eh? And so when they do it, the schoolboys get encouraged and they want to play like that and they want to do that. And that's what boys do with their fathers, don't they? And they watch how we live or whether we're spectators with our faith or we're on the playing field of life living and having our being. Buying a field in Anatot, that kind of faith. Against all odds, that kind of faith. That sort of faith. That sort of courageous faith. Jeremiah wasn't an if only. He just did what God asked him to do. And so why should we be able to live this way? And of course, it's all because of what Jesus has done. And so three just brief closing points as we're going to come around God's table. These beautiful words from Romans 5. Therefore, you got this, dads? Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into the grace we now stand. We've gained access to grace. How? You know, we were illegal immigrants now made completely legal. No one wants to be called an illegal immigrant, but you've been made, you know, a legal citizen of God and His family. That's why you can live beyond reason with hope. You've been made a citizen of the King of Kings. Peace with God. Gained access to grace. Able to stand in grace. Dads, are you with me today? And it continues. And we may rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our, in our, in our, in our suffering. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And so dads, not only have we gained access to grace, but our suffering is never in vain. It produces something. It's a means to this end. And I have to ask you parents, and I have to ask you fathers, Where will your children learn about grace if they don't learn it from you and I? Where will our children learn about perseverance, about character, 
about hope unless they learn it from us. Where will they learn about forgiveness if they don't learn it from us? There's a true story told of a, on a cold <clears throat> winter's evening, a man suffered a heart attack. And after being admitted to the hospital, he, was, he asked the nurse to call his daughter. And he explained, you see, I live alone and she is the only family I have. The nurse went uh, to phone the daughter. The daughter was quite upset and shouted, you must not let him die. You see, dad and I had a terrible argument almost a year ago. I haven't seen him since. All these months, I've wanted to go to him for forgiveness. The last thing I said to him was, I hate you. The daughter cried and then said, I'm coming now. I'll be there in 30 minutes. The patient went out, uh, sorry, went into cardiac arrest. Uh, and, um, you know, they, they brought in the help. And the nurse prayed, oh, God, his daughter is coming. Don't let it end this way. But the efforts from the medical team to revive the patient were fruitless. The nurse observed one of the doctors talking to the daughter outside the room. She could see the pathetic hurt in her face. The nurse took the daughter aside and said, I'm sorry. And the daughter responded, I never hated him. You know, I loved him. And now I want to go and see him. And the nurse took her to the room and the daughter went to the bed and buried her face in the sheets as she said goodbye to her, dece her deceased father. And the nurse, as she tried not to look at the sad goodbye, noticed a scrap of paper at the bedside table. She picked it up and she read, My dearest Janie, I forgive you. And I pray that you also will forgive me. And I know that you love me. And I love you too. A silly old story, isn't it? But <laughs> yeah, but it's true. And, and so dads, you know, we've gained access to grace. Will we extend that grace? We know that suffering is never in vain. How will, we, how will our children learn perseverance and character and hope? The hope that lives like Jeremiah did. And hope does not put us to shame, Paul says. Does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit whom He has given us. And hope brings us back to God. And so friends, as we're going to gather around this table, all of us, not just fathers, but fathers in particular today, because fathers, you have influence in your home. And how you live and have your being in your home rubs off on your children and on your spouse and on your in-laws and your outlaws. And whether we live in forgiveness and acceptance and love and you know, new beginnings, it, it, it pivots around dads. And Paul says, hope does not put us to shame. Hope does not disappoint us. And as we gather around this table, let's consider... Let's consider the shame that Jesus took on our behalf. Let's consider the, the shame that was on him, this table that he took into his life for you and I. And so dads, can you stay away from this table? No. Do we need this table? Yes. Do you need it, grandfathers? Yes, because your grandkids need it. And they need to learn from you. And Jesus took all our shame. You know, how can we live without shame? Because he took it on himself. How can we live with forgiveness? Because the Father turns away from him. And there is no sacrificial lamb for Jesus. He is the sacrificial lamb. And I'm asking you dads, how can you stay away from that? That kind of love. And so, Father, we pray that your grace would surround us today. Because, dads, ultimately, the answer is always going to be the gospel. 